University, Russian society. Uh, this evening is a special evening where I'm sure you're all aware Mr. Bosner is coming to give us a wonderful talk. And without further ado, uh, I'd like to invite them to the stage to start the discussion and his presentation, please. Thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure and honor to be asked to introduce Vladimir Posner. My name is John Barber, and I'm in the uh, Faculty of History, and I'm also a member of the Cambridge University Russian Society, which, of course, is uh, organizing this, this, this meeting. I've been going to the Soviet Union for uh, the best part of uh, 45 years, and for a lot of this time, the uh, archetypal uh, and uh, best informed uh, commentator on both uh, what was happening in the Soviet Union, then in post-Soviet Russia, and uh, m making that intelligible to uh, the, uh, the Western audience was Vladimir Pozner. Uh, he, I think, particularly came to uh, prominence during the perestroika period when uh, both uh, in uh, the West on American and British television and of course in Russia itself he played an invaluable role in uh, promoting uh, understanding of uh, what was happening uh, in, in Russia during perestroika and then of course in the uh, difficult years that followed uh, in the uh, 1990s and uh, in the, uh, the, the present century. What I think you must understand when you uh, listen to uh, Vladimir Posner is that he is, in the best sense of the word, a cosmopolitan, not a rootless cosmopolitan, the term of abuse that was used in the Stalin period, but a cosmopolitan by virtue both of his uh, his life experience, born in France, educated in New York until his late teens, then uh, uh, in Moscow, Moscow University, and so forth, but very much someone with his roots, both in Russia and in America and in Europe. And I think this has been the uh, quality that has uh, enabled him to be so uh, successful and in influential, both uh, as a broadcaster, as an author, as a maker of wonderful uh, travel documentaries, and uh, uh, also as the conductor of uh, uh, interviews with figures uh, both of uh, immense importance and uh, of just ordinary people. If uh, any of you are not aware of uh, his role in this uh, capacity, then get onto the internet and just type Posner interviews into there, and you can see you know, him interviewing, oh, Hillary Clinton, or, uh, or um, the, uh, the prisoner in Lu the Louisiana State Penitentiary, or Nikita Mikhailkov, or or just about anyone you 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 like to uh, pick. Anyway, uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, Vladimir Posner. It's a great privilege and honour to have you with us, you. and I know that uh, you, you will give us uh, a most tremendous talk. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Um, I, is this microphone working? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I very much regret that we have, <coughs> we don't have much time. I have to be back in London and I'm taking the 6.45 uh, train. So I have to leave here at about 10 past 6, which gives us just about one hour. <coughs> so what I'd like to do <coughs> is, um, uh, speak for about 25 minutes 
and then let you fire away with questions, which I hope you have. Because if after 25 minutes you have no questions, then I'll just leave earlier. That's fine. <laughs> Easy as that. Um, the relationship today between Russia and the West is probably at its lowest level since the worst days of the Cold War. Um, and I'd like to go into that and explain why this has happened, as I understand it. But I would like to begin by saying one important thing. I represent nobody but myself. I have not come here to speak in Mr. Putin's behalf or in the behalf of opposition to Mr. Putin. Uh, I'm a journalist. I try to be as even-handed as I possibly can be. Um, and I'd like you to understand that, because for me it's very important. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with a man by the name of George Kennan. Uh, he was probably one of the most brilliant statesmen of 20th century America, and he was a man who formulated uh, the policy of containment vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. He wrote an article many, many, many years ago signed X, simply, stating how the United States and the West in general should try to handle Soviet expansion. And the word he used was containment, contain Soviet Union. And that became the backbone of American policy. And when I say American, by that I mean Western policy, because let's face it, uh, ever since the end of World War II, U.S. policy has pretty much dominated what is called Western policy in general. So this man, uh, George Kennan, who died relatively not long ago, I think he was 103 when he passed away, um, was called up by one of the observers of the New York Times in May of 1998. Now you may recall that in 1998, the United States took the decision, it was actually President Clinton who took the decision, to enlarge NATO and to include some of the countries that had previously been in the Soviet bloc. And these were Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary. So this New York Times observer called up Mr. Kennan and asked him what he thought about this decision. And I'm going to read to you what Mr. Kennan said. I think, he said, it is the beginning of a new Cold War. I think the Russians will gradually react quite adversely, and it will affect their policies. I think it is a tragic mistake. There was no reason for this expansion whatsoever. No one was threatening anybody else. This expansion would make the founding fathers of this country turn over in their graves. What bothers me is how superficial and ill-informed the whole Senate debate was. I was particularly bothered by the references to Russia as a country dying to attack Western Europe. Don't people understand? Our differences in the Cold War were with the Soviet communist regime. Now. We're turning our backs on the very people who mounted the greatest bloodless revolution in history to remove that Soviet regime. I repeat, he said this in 1998. This was well after Gorbachev had come to power in 1985 and then had lost power in 1991. And this was the time of Boris Yeltsin. Now, I have interviewed... Uh, Mr. Um, Gorbachev three times and each time I have asked him specifically were you given any guarantees at all that NATO would not move eastward because after all NATO was created because of what was considered to be the possible Soviet threat NATO was and remains a military alliance to protect each other back then from a possible Soviet attack. All for one and one for all, if you wish. 
But then the Soviet Union disappeared. There was no more Soviet Union. And there was no more Warsaw Pact, which was the countries of the Soviet bloc put together. Why would you need NATO? Against whom? Who's the enemy in that case? And so I've asked Gorbachev, I say three times, did you get any kind of guarantee that NATO would not move eastward? And three times he said to me, yes, I was given an oral guarantee. I was given a, ba a, a guarantee by Secretary of State James Baker that if we allowed Germany to reunify, if we allowed the Berlin Wall to come down, NATO would not move one inch eastward. Germany reunified, the wall came down, and for several years, NATO did not move eastward. But then, during the Clinton period, it did. Um, Yeltsin, when this decision was taken, and he was president of Russia, asked the American side, didn't we have an agreement? And you know what they told him? They said, no. We had an agreement with the Soviet Union. You're Russia. We never had an agreement with you. Today's relationship, which I repeat is probably as bad as at any time after World War II, in my opinion, comes from this. NATO is seen by Russia as threatening. Now, you may argue that NATO is a defensive organization and that the Russians shouldn't be afraid of it. Well, they are afraid of it. One of the reasons for the whole Ukrainian debacle is the fear of the Russian government that should Ukraine be allowed to go west in general terms, then NATO will appear on Russia's southwest border. NATO has already appeared on Russia's border in such countries as Estonia and Latvia, which have a common border with Russia. Now, I often say, and I say this to Americans because I usually speak to Americans, I say, imagine for a moment, I mean, imagine the map. Now, the map of the United States, I think all of you can easily imagine, and you know where Mexico is vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. Perhaps the map of Russia is a bit more complex for you, but basically, Ukraine lies vis-a-vis -vis Russia pretty much like Mexico lies vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Now, imagine that there is a revolution in Mexico. It's not that hard to imagine. And imagine that it's anti-American, which is also not that difficult to imagine. And then imagine that this new Mexican government, which is somewhat fearful of Big Brother to the north, invites Russian troops to be on the border with the United States, just in case. You think the United States would allow this? Two independent countries, Mexico and Russia, have the right to make this kind of agreement. The United States would certainly not, just as it did not allow Russia to deploy missiles in Cuba. It said, no, it said, we'll declare war if you do this. Therefore, the point I'm trying to make is that this NATO threat for, for the Russian leadership, and not just for the leadership, is a reality. And there is really no reason for it. Now let me back up a little bit. When Gorbachev came in, and when suddenly everything changed, there was still the USSR, but it was a very different kind of USSR. Perestroika, glasnost, that is to say, a free press, an open press. Uh, really not much different from what you have in this country. Less of a tradition, to be sure, but certainly as vibrant. And then when this was followed by um, the disappearance, if you will, the downfall of the Soviet Union. 
the West, and in particular the United States, had two choices. They could either um, devise some kind of Marshall Plan type of, as they did after World War II, directed at Europe to make sure that fascism would not come back and communism would not appear, because there were strong communist parties in those days in France and in Italy. Or they could say, well, you've lost the Cold War. You're no longer a superpower. You're a second-rate country. Just shut up. We've heard enough of you. Those were two realistic choices that could have been made. Regrettably, at least in my opinion, the second choice was made. And Russia was made to understand that it simply didn't matter anymore. You know, Russia, no Russia, who cares? Now, it was still a nuclear superpower, to be sure. But nonetheless, that was the attitude that was taken. And perhaps the most telling example of that was the bombing of Yugoslavia, when Russian leadership almost pleaded with NATO not to do that, and was totally ignored. Clearly, the message was, we don't care what you care. We don't care what you say. You're no longer really of any importance. Um, that, coupled to the NATO development, led to great resentment. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever been to Russia, how, how well you know Russians and 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 their their um, mentality. But Russians have one thing in common with Americans. You know, very often I've heard it said, "Oh, Americans and Russians are very much the same." They're not. They're quite different. Their histories are completely different. Big countries, yes, but so what? That's not what determines it. As a matter of fact, Russians, in my opinion, are much more like um, are much more similar to the Irish. And I say this in all seriousness, although I laugh when I say it, because I know what you're thinking. <clears throat> but if you, actually, when you think about it, um, ups and downs, you know, we're, we're high, we're low, um, great literary talent, enjoy a good drink, a good fight, oppressed for a long time, the Irish by the Brits, or rather by the English, to be more exact. The Russians by the the, uh, the Mongols and the Tartars. There's a lot of common ground there. It's a different issue. But anyway, the similarity. Americans really do believe that they are exceptional. And that their country is exceptional. And that they have a special a special duty vis-a-vis -vis the world which is to teach all of you and everyone else um, the, um, the advantage of living like Americans. Um, to a very large degree, Russians feel the same way about Russia. That it's a country with a special faith. Um, that... Um, you know, back in the 16th century, one of Russia's more famous uh, religious figures said, um, Moscow is the third Rome, and there will not be a fourth. This feeling of a very special mission and of being a great country and a great nation. Just to give you an example of what I mean by that, like, for instance, the French don't think they're the best in the world. They know it. So they're not going to argue with it. Okay? But um, the, both the Americans and the, and, and, and the Russians will argue about their importance. So when the Russian people began to feel, and now the people includes the government. I mean, they're people as well, right? At least we think so. Um, when when they were pointedly turned down, rejected, insulted, you call it what you will, gradually, the resentment began to build up. 
And it was on this growing resentment that Mr. Putin appeared on the scene. His popularity today in Russia, the rating is, you know, it can be around 80%, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less, but extremely high. Although life has become more difficult because of the mistakes that were made in the economy and in putting too much uh, trust in the price of oil. Um, real income has gone down across Russia. Uh, inflation has gone up. Um, unemployment has gone up. And yet, the, popular, the popularity of Putin has not gone down. He is seen as someone who has brought Russia back, who has forced the West to take Russia into consideration, who has forced the West to admit that you can't deal with international terrorism without Russia's participation, you can't deal with the Middle East without Russia's participation, you have to take into consideration um, Russia's geopolitical interests. And so this feeling of pride, of we are a great nation, has come back thanks to Putin. Along with it has come back um, nationalism, chauvinism, a strong anti-Western sentiment. Uh, that is perhaps a real change compared to what existed during the Cold War, because during the Cold War, the average Russian was not anti-Western. Critical of the White House, yeah. Um, not liking Wall Street, suppose, not knowing it, but not liking it, um, true. But not anti-Western, not anti-American, on the contrary. Now that's all changed. Now there is very pronounced anti-American sentiment at the grassroots level. There is very pronounced, uh, feel, uh, very pronounced feelings about not being European. Well, I guess that's like you now. Right? <clears throat> uh, we are not European. We're separate. We're special. We're neither Asian nor European. We're special. We're Russian. And that's very much part of what's going on today um, in Russia. And I think it's very important to understand you know, why this is happening. There's a reason for it. And while I certainly do not support um, many of the political decisions that are taken by Russian leadership today, both uh, foreign and domestic. I must say that I feel that the root cause for this change in attitude um, is the policy that has been adopted vis-a-vis -vis Russia um, since the changes in the country since the the breakup of the Soviet Union. There are some people who actually believe that the Soviet Union ceased to exist because of Western pressure. Uh, let me relieve you of that thought. Um, the Soviet Union fell apart because of internal things. It was actually a, I might call it a, a building that was held together by two factors. Faith and fear. It's like an epoxy glue that, that really held the building together. Uh, have no doubt that for a great many years, the vast majority of Soviets profoundly believed in their country and in this new system that they were building. But gradually, gradually over the years, that faith disappeared. And the fear that had existed with the KGB and during the Stalin period also started to go away because after Stalin, the regime became much less of a, of a uh, fearful um, thing than it was. And finally, the glue just no longer glued and the country fell apart. For a great many people, that was a tremendous blow for people who had believed in the system, who thought, who thought about their fathers who had sacrificed so much for this system, 
their grandfathers who fought during the Civil War for this system. There had always been this belief that someday we will have the most wonderful country in the world. They were brought up with that. And then it turns out that it was all a lie. I've often spoken to people, uh, to Americans, and not only saying, look, imagine, if you will, that you profoundly believe in God and that you shape your life so as to celebrate that belief and you sacrifice during your entire life for that belief until one day it is scientifically proven that there is no God. How are you going to feel about all you've tried to do? And that was the kind of situation that um, an entire nation encountered uh, towards the end of, um, of the Soviet system. Hence, um, a complete breakup um, and a, 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 um, a nation of very cynical, um, disappointed people. And obviously crime waves, obviously immigration, and all of those things. And it's really under Putin, or because of Putin, or thanks to Putin, whatever way you want to look at it, that all of this has changed. And that you have a completely different mindset today in Russia than you did, say, 20 years ago or 15 years ago. These are things that I think should be understood. I always say, you know, when we look at another country, we always look at it from our framework, from our belfry. And we say, well, why, why don't they do it like we do it? Well, it's because they're different. And if you want to understand, you have to get down from your belt and climb up the other person's and look at it from there. If you want to make that effort. You don't have to. But if you don't make it, you'll never understand why they're different. Um, I think that probably... Uh, Russia, I mean, there's always been this myth about, about Russia. What was Churchill's famous dictum? Uh, Russia is a mystery wrapped in a riddle inside an enigma. <clears throat> Why so? What is so not understandable about Russia? Is it, uh, do you read Russian writers? Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Chekhov? Are they understandable? It would seem to me, yes. You listen to Russian music? You know, Tchaikovsky, Rachmaninoff, you name it. Not bad music. What is this idea of Russia being this, this riddle? Where does that come from? These are things that I think one should question, not just accept at, uh, at face value. Um, I'd I, as I said, I, I, I'm hoping that I'll be getting enough questions from you, uh, concrete questions, and, and please don't hesitate to ask whatever you want. If I don't know the answer, I'll say so. Or if I don't want to answer it, I'll also say so. Um, but um, I would like to underline that today we should be making an effort to try to, to, to bridge the gap that has now appeared um, we are becoming more and more afraid of each other. I was recently in Sweden, and I don't speak Swedish. Um, and the lady, uh, at, I was buying something, and the lady at the counter said, are you from New York? And I said, well, in a way, uh, because that's where I lived for a long time, but I'm actually from Moscow. Oh. Um, are you Russian? I said, in part. I'm half Russian. Well, tell me, why do you want to invade us? <laughs> um, I, I, I said, uh, sorry? She actually believed that Russia plans to invade Sweden. First the Baltics, and then Sweden. Where is that coming from? Who is stoking these fires? And why? Let me read you um, a quote, and uh, 
I wonder who's, maybe some of you know this, but if you don't, I'd like you to guess. The quote is as follows, if I can find it. Mm. Well, it should be here. Ah, yes, here it is. Naturally, the common people don't want war, neither in Russia nor in England, nor for that matter in Germany. That's understood. But after all, it's the leaders of the country who determine the policy. And it is always a simple matter to drag the people along, whether it's a democracy, or a fascist dictatorship, or a parliament, or a communist dictatorship. Voice or no voice, the people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. That is easy. All you have to do is tell them they are being attacked and denounce the peacemakers for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same in any country. Well, the man who said that took poison so as not to be hanged at Nuremberg. His name was Hermann Goering. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Nowadays, I sometimes wonder if people remember that there was a Second World War. Uh, he was uh, Hitler's field marshal, the head of his Luftwaffe, that is to say, um, his um, Air Force. This is what's happening today. We are being told by our media, we, I'm saying this generally speaking, that we're being attacked, we're being frightened, and we're also being told that those of us who refuse to be frightened and who stand up to that are somehow not patriotic. Therefore, I believe the situation is a very, very dangerous one right now. And in my opinion, uh, there are people responsible for this, first and foremost, the leadership, and then, of course, the journalists who cease to be journalists, but who are rather now propagandists. And that's not just in Russia, believe me. So those are, I just wanted to touch on things that really bother me, um, because I've been around for a long time, and I've, I've seen these things happen. Uh, and um, I feel that I should be speaking about this as publicly as, as possible. Um, basically, I guess I would, I, I, you know, if I had more time, I'd go into into um, the reasons in general for this um, attitude towards Russia. It's not it's not a, a new one. I mean, if you read um, a book that was written by a, um, an English um, merchant back in the 16th century, his name was John Fletcher. Already there you can find uh, this, this, this strange um, um, under, um, lack of understanding, rather, and, and, uh, and fear uh, of Russia. He, he would go to Russia uh, for furs and things like that, and he wrote a book about that. There's a, there's a history to this. But what's happening today is, um, is beyond that and is very dangerous. So if you'll allow me to um, to stop right there and perhaps to answer your questions, which I hope are coming, uh, then that, that would be good. If not, I have a lot more to say, so it's up to you. Sir. No, no. Yes, sir. I have no microphone. Right. Well, thank you very much for that extremely uh, illuminating and uh, thought-provoking talk. I'm sure there will be plenty of questions, and indeed we have, I think, uh, holders of microphones so that these questions can be ordered, audible to everyone. So where are we going to start? Uh, right, we have one here, please. Thank you very much. My name is Anton. I'm from Russia. My question is, when you talked about lack of understanding from the other countries about uh, Russian nature, 
and let's assume that it's, it, it is true indeed. But would that still not excuse the action and politics of the Russian leadership, which kind of tries to exploit that, uh, turn the attention of, the, of its citizens elsewhere to the external factors, whereas the economic situation within Russia deteriorates for other reasons? Is my question clear enough? No. So, no, my no. question, <laughs> I'll repeat that. So, even though there is a lack of understanding about the Russian uh, politics and the Russian uh, way of life, from the do you think it still does not ex excuse the way that the Russian leadership handles the political and economic situations currently, trying to turn the attention from the internal domestic problems elsewhere to the external problems? Thank you. Um, now I understand the question. One has nothing to do with the other. Uh, when I was speaking about the lack of understanding, or perhaps even the lack of a desire to understand uh, where the Russians come from and why they are what they are, that's a completely different story. Insofar as <coughs> um, Russian policies today, um, I don't agree with you that there's an effort to distract um, the attention of the Russian citizen from internal problems by calling his or her attention to uh, relations with the West or the problems in the West. I don't think that's true at all. Um, I don't know how often you go back to Russia, to what extent you read the opposition press. Um, there's a lot of, and the Russians are always complaining anyway. Uh, Russians are a grumbling nation. Um, they're not happy with their situation today. And if you look at the, the, uh, the, the um, elections that were held on September 18th to the Duma, which is the equivalent of parliament, um, less than half of the potential voters actually voted. 47 point something percent voted. And so 52 did not. Now, what does that speak to? Um, well, basically two things. One is either that they didn't see anyone they could vote for. No one attracted them. Now, for the first time in a long time, the West and different organizations that have followed the elections have said that these were, these were transparent, fair elections for the first time in a long time. Officially congratulated the Russian government on these elections. So it means that the voters could have voted for anyone, including opposition people, including opposition parties. Now, um, the only opposition party that got more than 1% of the vote, called Yabloka, or Apple, they got 1.4%. That's it. And these are open, free elections. So what it means is that the majority of the voters found no one to vote for, which is a pretty sad statement. Or the majority of the voters decided, my vote doesn't matter. Nothing is going to change anyway, so why should I vote? Which is just as bad. So with that kind of a, of a population, you can't distract them. They're interested in what's going on at home. That's what people care about. Yeah, you know, uh, this talk about what's going on in Syria, Aleppo. Interesting that one of the uh, U.S. Uh, candidates for the presidency doesn't even know what Aleppo is. He said, who is Aleppo? <laughs> Obviously he hasn't read Shakespeare because in, in, uh, in one of the plays, uh, Othello, he speaks about it. Anyway. Um, so no, I don't agree with you. I don't think so. And I don't think there's even an effort to do that. Um, and, and there's certainly no linkage between the fact that, you know, the West, in my opinion, really makes no effort to understand or, or cares about, uh, you know, what the Russians think and the policy of the Russian government, which I believe I said I do not support. I don't like it at all. Yeah, please. They'll give you a mic, yeah. Yeah, can you hear me now? A uh, question about the American presidential candidates. So you mentioned one of them. 
what is the probability that Donald Trump would be elected? And if you will, uh, is there be any softening in the conversation between Russia and America? I'm, I'm, I can't hear you very oh. well. Uh, so if Donald Trump will get elected, what, what, what are the chances? And uh, will the conversation between Russia and USA be any different, in your opinion? Well, um, I'm, I, I don't like, I'm not good at predicting. Um, I, when I was a young man, I used to say that, um, that I had a crystal ball and I looked into it and I could predict what would happen in five years and ten years. But over the years I moved around, I divorced several times and I lost some of my things, including my crystal ball. So I can no longer predict. So you know, excuse me. Um, insofar as uh, Donald Trump is concerned, um, looking at the, at the uh, statistics today, uh, the latest, uh, his chances are slim. It doesn't look like he's going to be elected. Of course, America is a country where it's very hard to predict. But then, no, not only America. Most people didn't think that uh, Britain would Brexit. And yet, there it is, right? So you never know. He could be elected. Personally, I think that would be a catastrophe, um, not just for America. Um, many Russians would like to see him elected because of what he said. You know, Hillary Clinton has been very negative about Putin. She said some very, very harsh words, whereas um, Donald Trump has said some pretty good things about Putin and about Russia. So. You know, this is all reported on Russian state-controlled television, let alone on not controlled. There's some of that as well. So for the average Russian, well, gosh, you know, we better, better, uh, Trump than, than this woman who seems to hate us, you know. Um, but what will happen should he be elected? I have no idea. Uh, I just don't think it'll be very good. Um, and should Hillary Clinton win, well, um, with the kind of rhetoric she's used vis-a-vis -vis Putin, it's going to be very difficult uh, for her to, to meet with Putin, I mean, to shake hands. Um, another very important point is whether or not the Democrats are going to win back the Senate. If they do, then she can, she has a lot of of freedom to do what she wants. Wants if if they don't, if it remains uh, in the hands of the Republican Party, there's going to be an impeachment movement because of her emails. So she'll be fighting impeachment inside her own country as soon as she's elected, if the Republicans are in a majority, which means that international stuff is going to be somewhat on the back burner. So it's a very complex kind of situation. I am an American citizen, I'm also a French citizen, and I'm a Russian citizen. <coughs> so I vote in all countries. Uh, I, I happen to think that voting is a duty, it's a responsibility. If you're a, a citizen, then you should vote and must vote. I never tell people who I'm voting for, but I vote. Um, so. I guess that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, in defense, I have two points to make and a question. In defense of Hillary Clinton with her re rhetoric uh, against Putin, I don't think that the rhetoric that comes from Russia, uh, and we've seen probably a lot of us, the comment of Mr. Lavrov on how many, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this word, pussies are in the uh, both sides of the American parties um, um, to the, uh, for the elections. Um, so the, the rhetoric coming from Russia isn't also very positive. Um, second point, it strikes me, um, I don't understand why, but I will never be able to accept it. It strikes me at the very beginning of your speech of how you speak of the entitlement that big powers, Russia or USA, have on small countries. Um, whether they want or not to be members of NATO, for instance. 
And I say that in a very subjective mode because I am from a very small country in Eastern Europe and I've also worked with NATO. Um, but my question is for you from your probably old friend Proust. Who? Marcel Proust. Marcel I, Proust. Oh, my old friend Marcel yes. Proust. Yes, sure. On what, in your opinion, um, um, is what is freedom for you, especially as a journalist in Russia? And I assume you won't answer the second question, but I'll still ask, whether do you feel that you have that freedom while working at uh, okay. Pierre Canal? Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let me just uh, very briefly answer your two comments. Comment number one, the fact that I called attention to Hillary Clinton's rhetoric in no way says that I support Russian rhetoric. I was simply making a point that with that kind of rhetoric, it's very hard to make some kind of rapprochement. Now, Putin, I was being very specific, Hillary Clinton, not Americans. You were saying Russia. Let's say Putin. Has Putin said the same kind of things about Hillary Clinton? The answer to that is no, he has not. These are two individuals who have to talk to each other. They have to, because they are the, the, the two countries that today uh, decide the fate of the world. I was in Reykjavik the day before yesterday to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Reagan Gorbachev. If Reagan and Gorbachev had not liked each other when they met, when they first met in Geneva in 1985, there would have been no Reykjavik, and the Cold War would not have stopped. Personal relations at that level are extremely important. And what I'm saying is that with that kind of rhetoric between concrete people, because the other is, what you have is the press repeating all of this stuff in both countries. I'm not talking about that. But with that kind of rhetoric, it's hard to hope for a normal conversation in a time that demands some kind of activity. Point number one. Point number two, NATO. I can understand countries of Eastern Europe wanting to be members of NATO. Of course. They were, um, they were, if you will, taken by the Soviet Union as a result of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, as a result of Yalta, and they are afraid of Russia. Historically, too. I understand that perfectly well. But if there is a, an agreement, I mean, you know, when Putin came to power, he said, let us join NATO. He was fully serious. And what was the answer? No way, Jose. So, you know, keep these things in mind. Now, freedom. Um, do I still have time? Yes. Look, I worked for six years in America on television. I was on CNBC. We did a show with Phil Donahue. I don't know if you know who Phil Donahue is, but he's the man who invented the talk show or what the Brits call the chat show. He invented this. He was a famous, famous man on U.S. television, and I, he and I did a show uh, for six years. It was called Hosner and Donahue. Um, it had the highest ratings in its time slot. After six years of work, CNBC got a new president. His name was Roger Ailes. Some of you may know who he is. If you don't, it's better that it be that way. Um, it reminds me of um, a man coming into an elevator with, uh, with um, um, who the hell was the guy's name, um, who just received the Nobel Prize. Um, yeah, but Bob Dylan. And he says, oh, Mr. Dylan, I know you, but you don't know me. And Dylan said, let's keep it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, Roger Ailes. And when the time came to renegotiate our contract, uh, Mr. Ailes invited us in and he said, look, we will renew your contract, but it has to have two additional clauses. Clause number one, you have to tell us what you want to talk about and we have to okay. Clause number two, you have to tell us who you're going to invite, because we always had a guest on the show, and we have to okay that. Because you, Donahue, are too much of a liberal and you, Posner, are way out in left field. I said, but uh, Mr. Ailes, that's called censorship. And he said, and I quote now, he said, I don't give a rat's ass what you call it. But that's the way it's going to be. 
We did not renew the contract. The show was killed. It disappeared. There was nothing in the papers about this. Nothing. Now, if my show in Russia is killed, and it might be, it's going to be on the front page of every damn newspaper I can think of. Not because I'm so important, but because, aha, see, it's those Russians. There is this attitude that somehow uh, the Russians are always worse. As someone who's worked in media for a long time, I can tell you that freedom of the press is a corridor that's either very wide or very narrow, but it always has walls. And if you want to break through that wall, you're going to be in trouble, whether it's in Russia, in Great Britain, or anywhere else. It's not limitless. It's not like you're completely free to say, write, whatever you want. In my concrete case, my show is bought by Channel One. I don't work for Channel One, but it's bought by Channel One in Russia. Does that mean I depend on Channel One? Sure it does. They can say, we don't want your show. End of story. So, do I have complete freedom? No. But thus far, I have been able to do what I want to do, which means I don't compromise my freedom. I agree to certain limitations, because there are always limitations. And I don't go, you know, just so far and I'm not going to go any further. In that sense, I consider myself to be an independent free journalist. Uh, in Russia today, the attitude towards freedom of the press is very cynical. The larger the, the audience, the smaller your freedom. The smaller your audience, the greater your freedom. In Russia today, you have opposition press that is anti-Putin from page one to the last page. But who cares? You know, they have 3,000 people reading that paper, so big deal. On Now, television is a different story. You reach millions of people, you are controlled. But again, I go back to America. When George Bush Jr. invaded Iraq, were any of the American networks, did they give anything against that invasion? I can tell you that they didn't. Nothing. So, you always have to look at it, you know, try to be unprejudiced and look at it as it really is. Am I happy with the situation of media in Russia? No, I'm not. Absolutely not. I think the government should get out of media. There should be no state-controlled media. But very often, company-controlled media can be just as bad as state-controlled. You know, again, it's what I've seen and what I deal with on a daily basis. And thank heavens, if I want to say, if, I'm, if I feel that I cannot do the job I want to do, I can leave it. Because over the years, and perhaps I shouldn't be saying this, but I will, uh, over the years I've made enough money not to fear losing my job. So I can just retire and live in Paris, for instance, where I have a very nice apartment. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> well, now we've got some hands coming up, finally. <clears throat> got, uh, we've got 15 minutes. Uh, uh, hello, uh, Mr. Posner. First of all, thank you so much. It's been an incredible pleasure to hear you live. Uh, I've got two questions. Uh, first question is, uh, don't you think that the uh, real fear of Russia, if there really is one, is coming from, like, we don't really know where eventually world is going to, uh, that the, uh, the, just because the Russia holds, uh, this very orthodox beliefs through all of the centuries. I'm not talking about religion views, but like the, uh, family views and, um, like, for instance, you know, when, when you're starting a date, a Russian woman, what is it like to, to date a Russian woman? What is it like to date a Russian man? I don't know. It's just because the Western society is not really aware of that, and eventually they discover a wonder, you know, like Borsch and all this jazz. Uh, and um, that, that's where the fear of Russia is coming from, the fear of unknown. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, and my second question is, you might be one of those privileged people who know, has man ever been on the moon? Thank you. <laughs> Um, 
I, I don't believe that your second question has much to do with what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Although I will tell you a, a Russian joke, actually a Soviet joke about that. Um, um, this was during, I think it was uh, Kennedy's time, the joke came up. But some One of Kennedy's aides comes running and he says, uh, Mr. President, Mr. President, the Russians are painting the moon red. And Kennedy says, that's okay, let them do it. And then two days later, the man comes, they've nearly painted the entire moon red. Says, that's fine, that's fine, okay. And then a day later, the man comes and says, well, it's, they've painted the entire moon red. Kennedy says, well, that's fine. Now we go up there and write Coca-Cola. <laughs> <coughs> you know, Russians are very good at making jokes about themselves, which is one of the things I think brings them closer to the English. They love good jokes about themselves. Now, the unknown. Uh, Russia is unknown because what? Russia doesn't want to be known? Russia is trying to hide something? Uh, Russian women? Well, Western men seem to like them a lot, you know. Uh, I really, I think, uh, certainly we, we're always somewhat wary of the unknown. Suspicious of the unknown. But we should also ask ourselves, well, why is it unknown? Why don't you know about it? Why don't you know about it? Why, why aren't you taught in school? And what are you taught in school about <laughs> Russia? So I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of questions to ask yourself. Um, there's one, one Russian joke I've got to tell you because it's probably the best I ever heard. It's Soviet, of course, obviously. Because that was when it was really funny to live in Russia. Um, there was an international uh, symposium, um, the aim of which was to discuss the ethnicity of Adam and Eve, because the Bible says nothing about that. You know, Adam and Eve, who were they? So there's this, this international symposium, and the French delegate gets up and he says, well, ladies and gentlemen, it's obvious that they were French. Who but a French woman would give up paradise for love? At which point the British uh, delegates, as much as I expect my French colleague, they were English, of course, because nobody but an English gentleman would give up paradise for his lady. Uh, the Soviet delegate says, this is all capitalist, uh, you know, forget it. We, we have the proof that they were Soviet. And it's triple. Number one, they had only one apple for the two of them. <laughs> Number two, they had almost no clothing to speak of. <laughs> and most importantly, number three, they thought they were living in paradise. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, Mr. Posner. Um, you've said in the past that you believe that we should engage with Russia, meaning the West should engage with Russia and not isolate it. However, do you think that engaging with Russia justifies the uh, actions of Putin, specifically in Ukraine, but also uh, his actions towards the world? Thank you. Well, there are two ways of looking at this. Um, when you make a decision of that sort, you should always begin by asking yourself, is it in our interest? Forget about humanitarian, forget about is it good or is it bad, is it in our interest to engage, in this case, Russia? What happens if we isolate Russia? Is that in our interest? What are the consequences? Now, I participated in a debate in Canada about this called the Monk Debate where I basically said, look, what happens in Russia if you isolate it? First of all, it becomes unpredictable. You don't know what's going to happen. You have no contact. Second, you're strengthening the hand of the anti-Western party. They're saying, see, we told you. So you're getting more reactionary, more anti-Western people into power. Third, 
you're playing into the hands, you'll excuse me, of the Russian Orthodox Church, which is a very anti-Western church nowadays. Now, is that in your interest? If it is, go right ahead. My feeling is you have to engage. It is in your interest, and it has nothing to do with what's going on in Ukraine or not going on in Ukraine. First of all, you have to try to understand what and why it's going on. That's a, a different I issue that should be discussed. About the rest of the world, I really don't know. The actions towards the rest of the world. Uh, Russia would say, what about the actions towards us? What are these sanctions? What are you trying to do to us? Do you think Mr. Putin suffers from sanctions? Do you think the Russian leadership suffers from sanctions? Who suffers in the long run? Well, it's your average Russian guy. So you're making him more anti-Western. Or do you really think that because of these sanctions, the Russian people are going to rise up and get rid of Putin? The Russian people probably, you know, there's an American uh, expression, uh, when things get tough, the tough... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it goes... Uh, uh, when, the, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Well, that's the way the Russians are. The more difficult things are, the tougher they stand. That's part of the national character. It is. When things are very good, that's when they kind of, you know, are not very good at this. <laughs> Strangely enough, but that's, again, it's the history of the people. So, um, if you're trying to punish Russia, if that's the idea, we should punish the Russians by not engaging, then I think that's a big mistake. The more you engage, the better it is. I would say, do your best to get more and more Russians to travel abroad. Get more and more Russian kids to live in Western homes for a year. Get exchanges going. Impact the country that way. Then you can hope for real change. You isolate, you're not going to get anything, except maybe a very <coughs> negative kind of situation. Uh, so that's what I would say to you. Now, I have, um, according to my information, five minutes left. I regret that, but I'm going to have to leave. So probably one more question. And it's your decision. <laughs> who, who is this? I'd like it to be a non-Russian, if possible. All right. Hello, uh, Mr. Posner. I'm from Ukraine. My name is Elena. That's pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> I was ex-born in USSR. Could you hold the microphone yeah. closer? My, my question is very simple. Uh, in Russia, there is such concept as справедливость. Pardon me? Справедливость. Справедливость. Yes. Yeah. In Russian, there is such concept as справедливость. Uh, it's very um, like base of Russian uh, mentality. It's not really justice. It's not really fairness. It's not really uh, impartialness, but something much deeper for Russian mentality. And I wanted to ask you, is there uh, English word which represent such concept as справедливость. Reflects, reflects справедливость. Yes, and if there is no, do you have an idea of why? Thank you. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, I, you, I once upon a time wanted to be a translator of, of English poetry, specifically Elizabethan. So I've dealt a lot with this issue of language. And while the word may be the same, it doesn't convey the same feeling. Um, and then there are some words that don't exist. Like, for instance, uh, what you call privacy and what Americans call privacy. There is no such word in Russian. You cannot say it. You can explain it. But the notion of privacy does not exist in the Russian language. And that says a lot. Now, справедливость, you might say, is fairness, justice. Again, in Russian, it's got a, a broader and a deeper uh, kind of, um, of um, feeling to it. 
why in one language you have something and in another you don't, I really don't know. That's not my area of, uh, of uh, expertise. But I definitely would not draw profound conclusions out of that situation. Now, I will take one more question, provided it doesn't come from a Ukrainian, a Russian, a Belarus, a, a native British would be nice. Do we have a native British? Oh, good. That sounds good. Not to Go right ahead. Whatever. Um, Mr. Paul, a pleasure to meet you. And two simple questions. What is it like for you? Oh, okay, one. What is it like for you to um, being a patriotic? What is it like to me to be a patriotic? Patriotic. What's the other question? Well, let me put it this way. <clears throat> Thank you. I think it's a very simple thing. Being, I mean, as I understand patriotism, it's simply you love your country. That's all there is to it. You can enlarge that and say you um, you you suffer from things that hurt your country, uh, from negative things. You you pay more attention to the bad things in your country because you want to get rid of them. That's also to me a kind of patriotism. Um, I think it was an Englishman who said, um, patriotism is the last uh, <laughs> refuge of a scoundrel. Meaning by that that when you have no other argument, you wrap yourself in the flag and you, you know, um, that's not what I call patriotism. Uh, if, if, if you understood Russian, I'd, I'd read, I'd read you a tiny little poem by a poet called Lermontov, uh, who was without doubt a great Russian patriot, but who in this poem castigates Russia for certain, certain things. So, you know, I would say it's like, you know, do you love your mother? Yes. Are there things about her that you don't like? Yes. But you still love your mother. So that's the kind of thing, as I understand patriotism. Nowadays, of course, and not only nowadays, it's more like jingoism, um, chauvinism, we're better than you, we're the best. Uh, that's not patriotism. Much to my regret, ladies and gentlemen, I must leave you, otherwise I will miss my train and that will probably lead to a divorce. So, <laughs> thank you again. <laughs>